Heavens, this is awful. Wars, rumors of wars, murders, robberies, accidents. I don't even want to think about any of that. Perhaps it's all for the best, Mr. Saxon. If we thought about nothing but bad news all the time, well, we... Shall I make more coffee, or will this be sufficient? I'd appreciate it if you would make more. I'm expecting a guest this morning, and he may be in need. Of course. Spencer. Yes, Mr. Saxon. There is one piece of bad news that does seem to stay with me. And that's about Raven. Yes, ma'am. When Raven was ill, why didn't you try to reach me in Washington? Did you try? No, ma'am, I'm afraid we didn't. Well, I suppose it's my fault for not leaving a number where I could be reached. I'm very sorry that it happened that way, Mrs. Saxon. I'm terribly distressed by this whole thing. There she is, gone off to a, a foreign sanitarium without telling a single soul where she is. I think she wanted it that way. There's another thing that worries me, too. What's that, ma'am? I'm awfully afraid that Raven might have fallen into the hands of some incompetent doctor or someone who might try to take advantage of the situation. She's not exactly a charity case, you know. She's an extremely wealthy young woman. And there are some people in this world who would do anything for money. Wolfie, it's me, Al. Hey, Wolfie! What are you doing, sleeping in there? Come on, Wolfie! Man, knock off all that racket, will you? Hey, it's not in the paper. Guess they didn't find the body yet. Oh, well, I decided to keep this cargo for a while. She's sleeping it off here. Oh, and the shut bottom. the hell up. All right. I'll rephrase the question. Why ain't she fish food? Because I took her to the spot last night, and just about as I was going to dump her into the drink with a big splash, something told me to take a look into this money pouch. So? So I took a look. Something tells me I'm not going to like this. Yeah, you know what I come up with? Nothing. There's nothing in there except a bunch of old torn newspapers. I knew I wasn't going to like it. Newspaper? Right. She deliberately put a dummy envelope into the hotel safe to make it look good and throw off any would-be thief. Now what? I don't know, but that damn money is somewhere. Where? I don't know where, but she knows where. When she wakes up, she's gonna tell us once she's out of this chloroform sleep. Come on, you, wake up! Wake up! What are you doing here? Don't look so surprised. It's Spencer, Mrs. Saxon invited me. Good morning. Good morning. Won't you sit down? Yes, thank you. That would be all, Spencer. Yes, ma'am. Coffee. Yes, uh, black, please. Thank you. So. Here we are. Here we are. Are you finding it difficult to begin? A little. I told you, I think, that I have been intrigued by your story. Yes. Mind you, that doesn't mean I'm convinced of it. But it does mean that I am willing to help you find the proof that will convince me and others. That's a very kind offer and the most promising one I've had since I've been back here in town. I don't mind telling you that trying to convince people I am who I say I am is a rather discouraging business. 
you won't regret it. I have to admit that I'm very much interested in getting to the bottom of this whole thing. Either way. Now, what do you want of me? Everything that you can remember about the man who called himself Skylar Whitney. And called her his wife. Oh, dear. Where to begin? Well, he came back here to Monticello about a year and a half ago. I had sold this house several years before and was living in a residential hotel suite at the Monticello Arm. Naturally, I was very much surprised to see Skyler. <clears throat> that is, to see him, after all those years he spent in Europe. In any case, he threw himself into the cultural and business life of Monticello. He opened and closed a professional dance company, for one thing, and immersed himself in all kinds of corporate businesses throughout this whole country. He pursued, and was pursued by, Raven. They were married a year ago, and he bought this house as a wedding present. Both he and Raven were very insistent that I come back here to the family home and live with them. It seemed sensible at the time. Oh, yes. Everything that he did seemed sensible and reasonable. And it all fell into place so easily for him. He surrounded him with things that would make him seem genuine. He bought this house. You see, living in the Whitney estate would mean that he was a Whitney. He invited you to live here with him. One family under one roof. If that's true, young man, he was diabolically clever. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed, that he was. He even hired my own servant. Gunther was your servant? Yes, he worked for me in Europe for several years. He was my butler, my chauffeur, my general factotum. And he must have been an accomplice in the charade. It's possible, I suppose. No. Gunther must have known all about it. No one in the world knew me the way Gunther did. Perhaps that's the way that Jeff found out as much as he did about my family history. Why wasn't Gunther with you when that plane crashed in Switzerland? Gunther was vacationing in Paris when we were in St. Moritz. And Jeff appropriated him the way that he did everything else in my life. It's incredible, isn't it? Yes. But not impossible. It's so bizarre to be so alienated, so cut off from everything and everyone that I knew. and to have no one know who I am. I'm trying to. Skylar. If I can get you ladies anything else, just give me a holler. Thank you. Okay. So, to start off, I, I guess I'm curious about the reason for this meeting. Yes, I can understand your curiosity. You're a friend of Skylar Whitney, you said? That's right. And his brother? Yes. The one who came to see me. As a matter of fact, we're engaged. Is that right? Well, it sure is an amazing resemblance, isn't it? It's uncanny. Well, they were identical twins. It had to be. Uh, what's his brother's name? Uh, Jason. Uh, Jason Whitney. Oh. So you're engaged to him. I bet I know what's going on. You do? Sure. The two of you think you're going to get some of that money from Skylar's estate. I can see you're a very perceptive woman, Mrs. Weston. I'm not stupid. I can see right through people. People like Valerie Bryson, for example. I suppose you know her, too. Yes, I do. And to know her is to dislike her. Oh, I hope that doesn't offend you. I know you were friends at one time. Why should it offend me? Who cares? 
Anyway, I can see I'm not the only person who thinks she's something less than terrific. Yes, that wide-eyed innocence was wasted on me, too. Frankly, I didn't bite for a minute. She's an operator, all right. And I saw her operate when we were in Switzerland together. Oh? What happened? She stole Sky Whitney away from me without blinking an eyelash. She knew how I felt about him. That's what happened. But even that wasn't enough for sweet Miss Valerie Bryson. She late dated his friend Jeff Brown under his nose, and Sky didn't know a thing about it. She wasn't satisfied with one man. She had to have two for her collection. Left no one for me. Really? No wonder you feel the way you do. Well, she was slick, all right, but not slick enough to fool me. I could see what was going on. Mrs. Weston, I hope you won't think I'm presuming too much, but I want to ask you a very important question. Go right ahead. Do you think it possible these late dates with Jefferson Brown were more deceptive, more important than just dates? I don't understand. What are you getting at? I mean, do you think they were meeting to conspire against Skylar Whitney? I appreciate you joining me for lunch, Damien, especially since it was on such short notice. It's no problem. I've been in a state of suspended animation lately. I really have a lot of time on my hands. It's always a pleasure to have such an attractive dining companion. Well, thank you. Thank you. Hi, may I help you? Uh, should we have a drink? Why not? A glass of white wine, please. Okay. I'll have the same. Two white wines. The uh, reason for my call. Well, yes, this is about the police hearing, no doubt. Mm -hmm. I knew you wouldn't think too much of the story. I hope you understand that I was obliged to write it. Sure. Well, the information seems clear and essentially correct. What do you want, my approval? No, 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 no. Uh, the story is already on its way to the composing room for the evening edition. I see. However, I think that you deserve a chance to tell your side of the story. So if it's all right with you, we could use this time as a private interview. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. I wish all representatives of the press were as objective and unbiased as you are. Obviously, I'd love to clear up any misconceptions made by the other articles that have been written, but I'll tell you, I'd have to clear any statement I might make with the police department. Okay, well, why don't we let me write it first before we worry about clearance? Right? All right, everyone has had his say. It's your turn. Why not? I guess the best place to start is with Eddie Lorimer's motivation. Mm -hmm. You see, several months ago, I was involved in an undercover case, and I had to deal with some guys who were running illegal guns. And I was at this time that I met... Well, well, it really is amazing, the people you run into. Hello, Mrs. Carr. Mr. Lorimer. Detective, uh, or is that Mr. Tyler? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not interrupting anything, am I? No, 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 no. Nothing that uh, can't be continued later. Well, that's good. I'm very happy to uh, run into you people today. Uh, <clears throat> I'll take this... Uh... Detective Tyler, you've been drinking a little too much. This is no good for your health. Listen, I've got something very interesting I'd like to talk about. Eddie, there's nothing you could tell me that would interest me in the least. Now, why don't you just take off? Uh, excuse me, perhaps uh, Mr. Laura might have something interesting, something pertinent to say. Thank you, Mrs. Carr. You're not only beautiful, but you're polite. Well, what I want to talk about, uh, I have now lost two employees in my company. It seems they arrested... Uh, guy who runs the furnace at my salvage plant, a kid named Vinnie Green. Nice kind of a kid. I mean, a little wild, but nothing really uh, harmful. Nice boy. It seems they uh, found some stolen merchandise in his closet, and apparently a buddy of his stashed it there. They had a little argument over some chippy or something or another. And, uh... That's just fascinating. So what? Well, I'm afraid uh, Vinnie is going to do a little time in the can. <laughs> That's a pity. <laughs> You know, uh, I thought it'd be very interesting, Tyler. Now, just what if Poppy Johnson was willing to change her testimony and change her disposition, you know, a little bit? Um, it would be interesting uh, to see what the police department might want to do about it. You know, a little plea bargaining kind of thing. You think they might let Vinnie go? What do you think, Detective Tyler? Pretty big trouble here, aren't we? 
because of this joke on Raven Whitney. That's why we're here at this meeting, yes. Well, I gotta tell you, I'm a little uh, scared about this whole thing. I mean, I've uh, never been in a district attorney's office before. There's no reason to be scared, Miss Martin. Although this is quite serious, this is not an official police hearing. Nothing you say will be recorded or used against any of you. But we do need all the facts. We've got reason to believe that Raven is in serious danger, so I do want to hear it all. Well, I should start off. I think I hold most of the responsibility. It was my theater group. I didn't like the idea from the beginning, but I did go along well, with hold, it. Hold Jim, wait. Mike, you, you can't hold Jim responsible, really. He was against us from the beginning. He tried to talk us out of it. He was the only one who told us we were crazy. <laughs> and crazy we were. Unfortunately, I think I was crazier than most. You see, these were actors playing parts, but uh, I, much to my regret, was foolish enough to play myself. Brilliantly. Chief Mallory, you can't blame Calvin for this. I mean, he was an innocent bystander by the time we pulled him into this thing. I, see, it was agreed that everyone who would participate in this would uh, have to act out a little scene. And uh, if Calvin pulled out, he would have ruined everything. So under the pressure, he went along with it. I uh, played myself, too. Clifford Nelson, attorney at law. Attorneys are supposed to exercise good judgment, Cliff. Why didn't you? Why did you play this game? Be because Raven was going to take the theater away from us. Oh, Mike, if you could have seen Mitzi's face when we found that out. Oh, look, I don't want to offer any excuses. We were all guilty. It's just that well, we didn't know that behind the scenes, everything was being manipulated by Smiley Wilson. Wilson's a very clever man. He is, very. He even got you into this, Mike. What are you talking about? I want you to listen to this. Hello, Raven. It's Mike Carr calling. I'm sorry Mike, to have to bother you, you with this. No, it's not Mike. It's smiling, imitating Mike. I must admit, like it sounds pretty good, you. even to me. All right, listen, I want to run down to the whole cast of characters involved in this little play. Well, you know the parts that we all played. The smiling who engineered the whole thing, and his brother Hector, who was a police sergeant at the uh, precinct house, and he also was a newscaster later on, and, and the cameraman was played by uh, Johnny Gentry, who also played the gigolo uh, who lured Raven up to the hotel room, and, and uh, that's it. That's not it. There's one more you forgot. The woman who was murdered, the one who, who Raven thought she killed. Oh, come on, we don't have time to waste. Who was she? Well, uh, Chief, the woman who was <clears throat> killed by the fake bullets uh, was Jinx Avery. Uh, excuse me, officer. I'm looking for Spring Street. Could you direct me? Spring Street. Yes. Uh, certainly, certainly, ma'am. Go out this way, and when you get outside, take a right, go to the corner, take a left, and go down three blocks, and you can't miss it. Oh, okay. I don't know what we'd do without New York's finest. <laughs> Thank you, officer. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm happy to be of service, ma'am. New York's finest. I love it. She is still breathing, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, right. How much chloroform did you give her? Just enough. Oh. She'll be up. Come on, you wake up. Come on. Come on. Where am I? You're at the travel agency. Everything's okay, sweetheart. Oh. But you got to remember something. And I want you to remember. Start remembering real fast. Like, uh, what the hell is all this? <laughs> oh, there's this, um... A motorcycle guy following me. A motorcycle guy? And he was after my money, and uh, so I put the empty bag in the safe. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Where's the real stuff? Hey, you, you. You're going to be asleep a long time if you don't start talking. Listen me, nobody's even going to lay a finger on you. Ain't that right, Al? Absolutely. Come on, you guys drugged me. If you had the money now, I would be dead. <laughs> That's one of the most ridiculous statements I've ever heard. You can bet a lot of money you're never going to find me involved in that kind of scam, right, Al? Right. You liar! The only reason I'm alive now is because the bag was empty. If you had the money, I'd be dead. See, this is a dame's logic, see? I told you she's smart, Al, right? Yeah, you said. Look, Al, why don't you go outside? 
And keep your eyes open. I don't want anything to interfere with this conversation, if you get my drift. I got you. Look, oh, sweetheart. Uh, Time is running out for me, and it's running out for you. Now, I'm tired of being a nice guy. And we can either do this one or two ways. The nice way, or the hard way. Wolfie! Uh, it's a cop. Just get out. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up and stay there. Open up. It's the police. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it, hold it. 